Why don't people still talk about this thing? It's the often overlooked sports coupe meant to do battle with the Toyota Celica. There was an SI. There was a four-wheel steering. There was torque vectoring. There was VTEC. Ah! It was the flagship of the golden era of Honda, and it had all the Honda ingredients to attain cult-like import tuner status, like your boy. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Honda Prelude. Ah! It was 1978 and things were going pretty good for the Honda company. They'd been exporting cars to the US since the beginning of the decade and by 1977, both the Civic and Accord were changing American minds about the usefulness of small Japanese cars but they had a bit of a gap in their little lineup. Back in high school, we had a gap in our cheer squad lineup and they made me be a flyer and the main base. <laughs> It wasn't easy, let me tell you. Anyway, they needed something sporty. Honda saw that Toyota Celica was doing pretty well with its long hood, short deck style, and figured they could do the same. So they yanked the engine, suspension, and brakes out of the Accord and threw it into a new chassis drawn up by chief Honda engineer Hiroshi Kazawa. The result was the first Prelude, and it wasn't very good. Honda Prelude. Honda knew the Prelude wasn't great and they still wanted a sporty coupe. Turns out the first Prelude was just a Prelude to the Prelude. So they went back to the drawing bird and started dreaming up something truly groundbreaking. Something with, what's the word? Pizzazz. If you wanna be noticed, you gotta have the juice, kid. Honda kept the long hood and short deck lid, but knocked a few inches off the hood height and belt line, giving the impression that the new Prelude was a lot lower than it actually was. But this presented a new problem for the engineers. Since the hood was lower, there wasn't enough room for the traditional McPherson strut suspension present on the first gen Prelude. The new car would need something new. Enter. Double wishbone suspension. This new double wishbone setup used two control arms running parallel to each other and kept the wheel perpendicular to the ground, even around sharp corners. On top of that, it was much more compact, saving space. Just a quick side note, I used to be um, much more compact as well. A little fluffy these days. <laughs> Anyway, the double wishbone suspension was the missing piece in the Prelude puzzle. No more understeer, and now it was as fun and sporty as it looked. The second gen Prelude released in 1983 was the real deal, and it was one of the best handling cars of the early 80s. In 1985, Honda made the Prelude even better by adding disc brakes in the rear and introduced a sport-oriented model. It had a new fuel injection system and was sporty. Sport injected hot dog let's call it the si the japanese version made 110 ponies through the front wheels while we in the u.s got a smaller engine that only made 100. why do we always get the short end of the stick <laughs> you know what it doesn't matter because like pretty much every other honda through history it wasn't about the power okay the prelude was about driving feel and she delivered people freaking <laughs> Love the thing. It was one of the only Japanese sports coupes you could buy in the US at the time. Finally, Honda's dream of an affordable sports coupe was realized. So did they rest on their laurels? Did they just sit back, high five, and have a cup of tea? Hell no, because that is not the Honda way. They rolled their sleeves up and pulled their pencils out. They put on their glasses and they got to work making it Better! Lightning, 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 lightning! 1988 saw the third gen Prelude released. They took the double wishbone, clicked Control C, Control V, and put them in the rear, making the Prelude even better around the bend. The new Prelude borrowed a few styling cues from the forthcoming NSX, which you can learn about here. It's a great car. I saw a really clean one yesterday. The third gen SI also had the most powerful engine Honda had ever put in a car at this point, making 135 hersperers. What? 
135 horsepower? Are you kidding me? They should have called this the Honda Jack Nicholson because this is as good as it gets, right? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty good. It's probably as good as it could probably get. Wrong! Honda had been working on a little thing for the Prelude SI called four-wheel steering. Now, the Prelude's rear wheels would move counter to the fronts, making low-speed things easier, like parking or cruising by livestock auctions to check out the 4-H babes. And at high speeds, the rears turned the same direction as the fronts to help with high-speed cornering and canyon carving. Um, who wants a piece of canyon? Honda's sitting on top of the world, so they took some time for reflection. The team gathered by a koi pond, not too small, but not big enough to totally dominate the backyard, muy tasteful. They sat silently by the edge of the pool, watching fish glide by as delicate cherry blossom petals floated on the water's surface. Hey, I got an idea. What is it now, Greg? What if we put VTech in the prelude? Silence, once again, filled the air around the koi pond. And Greg's suggestion, like the ripples of the koi pond, grew in the minds of the engineers. They all looked at Greg with tears in their eyes. Not bad, Greg, not bad. Honda had developed a variable valve timing system called VTEC. You ever heard of it? Honda VTEC. You wanna learn more about VTEC? Check out this episode of Science Garage. VTech made its Prelude debut in 1993, two years before Post Malone was born. They must have known because they gave it a 2.2 liter engine. Guys, it's numerology. It makes a lot of sense. The 2.2 liter engine made a very impressive 190 hertzpers that launched the coupe from zero to 60 in 7.2 seconds, which is pretty good considering it was 1993. Heck, back in 93, I was on my BMX bike cruising by the livestock auctions checking out 4H babes. The engine wasn't the only new addition. Gone were the boxy stylings of the 1980s. The new Prelude was rounder and more aggressive up front. This is the prelude of my childhood. This is the prelude that I would stay up way past my bedtime, sneak into the computer room, remember computer rooms before everyone had their own computer and every family had a computer in a room, and look up preludes for sale on eBay. The signature horizontal taillight gave way to individual lamps. The entire style was shifted to a more sporty fastback look, which further highlighted the prelude's hard driving ambition. The killer combination of double wishbone suspension all the way around and VTEC power bah! resulted in one great car. 1997 saw the release of Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill, Oscar winning film Con Air, and the fifth generation prelude with styling that returned to a boxier motif. Oddly enough, that was the same year I fell in love with cars. My dad had come back for the fourth time in three years. It was a hot summer and my old man was taking advantage of my tiny hands by making me work on his car with him. I wasn't really into it to be honest. To Peepaw, helping meant holding a flashlight for him and getting yelled at. Just like every time you work on a car, we had to make a parts run. You know, because we forgot some parts. I'll never forget the cool AC hitting my face as I walked through those sliding glass doors. It must have been how Perseus felt when he first set eyes on the Temple of Athena. The sprawling white entryway, like a beacon to travelers welcoming me home. And that's when I saw them. Manny, Mo, and of course, Jack. If these guys liked working on cars, well heck, maybe I did too. I didn't have the courage to say anything. My cowardice ate at me the whole time in the store. And then it was too late. Dad had his parts and we were on our way back out into the summer heat. And then I heard something. I turned around and there they were. I haven't taken this hat off since, not even to shower. Prelude purists were a little put off by the new headlights, but honestly, I think this one has aged the best of all the ludes. Oh, I'm the only one that calls them that? Oh, I'm weird? It's short for Prelude. This time around, it was a little longer, but still super wide. The Prelude was in the twilight of its life, reveling in the fact that it was still a super solid car. But as per usual, Honda wanted to make it 
a little bit better. They introduced a new trim level called the Prelude Type SH, and on the surface, not a lot was different. The 2.2 liter VTEC was still under the hood, but this time around, it was mated to a little thing called the Active Torque Transfer System, or ATTS. <laughs> It wasn't a walking war machine used by the Empire, but a clever device that controlled clutches in the differential to send power to the outside wheel in a turn, helping the car rotate. The system was effective enough that some reviews said it felt like the SH was a rear wheel drive car. Sick! By 2000, the Prelude had a full 200 horsepower. Hell yeah, round numbers, I love it! But unlike its Civic, Integra, and NSX brethren, the Prelude never got the Type R treatment, which would have been <laughs> pretty rad. There was a Type S, which made 17 more horses. <laughs> but only Japan got it, cause you know. Honda was beginning to see the writing on the wall for the Prelude. Sales of the fifth gen were dipping hard. With a price tag of nearly 40 grand in today's money, it was hard for buyers to justify choosing the Prelude over the Civic or even the Accord Coupe. In the Prelude's last year of production, less than 10,000 were sold in the US. So Honda pulled the plug. Yo dudes, we are working hard to double our content, new shows all the time. To make sure you don't miss any, hit that subscribe button. You wanna buy some sweet donut merch? Go to shop.donut.media. Follow me on Instagram, at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut on Instagram, at Donut Media. I love you. Ugh.